It's a little taste of heaven, just a little, little slight glimpse. There's the choir saying and thinking about Revelation chapter 5, uh, verse 11, it says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen? Amen. It's what we worship the Lord for, Jesus, the Lamb who was slain. If you have your copy of God's Word, you can begin turning to Isaiah 53, and we'll get there in just a minute. Isaiah chapter 53. I heard about a, um, a guy, and uh, someone told me the story one time, and it was a guy who was Jewish. He was talking with a guy who was a Christian. And, of course, the guy who was Jewish, um, being a Jew, doesn't believe that Jesus uh, of Nazareth is the Messiah prophesied about in the, what we would call the Old Testament scriptures, what he would call the Hebrew scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, and um, doesn't believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies, doesn't believe that Jesus is that Messiah. And so, of course, the Christian wanted him to, uh, wanted him to believe that Jesus is the fulfillment of that, that he is the promised one. And uh, so he said, can I read you uh, a passage um, uh, from, from the Bible? And a uh, Jewish man agreed, and so he began to read. And he read a passage, and this passage talked about this one who, who was born and who didn't look like much, and he was rejected by people. He was a, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, uh, as one from whom men hide their faces. And then he continued to read, and in this passage it says that this one who was called a servant was, was pierced for the transgressions of his people, that he was, he was wounded, and by his wounds, the people were healed. And the Christian began to uh, continue to read this passage, and, 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 and this passage went on and said that this servant, this one who was rejected and who was pierced, was, was ultimately killed, and then was buried. And the Jewish man looked at the Christian man and he said, ha ha, that's from, the, that's from the New Testament. You're talking about Jesus. I know you're trying to read me a passage about Jesus, but that's from your New Testament. And, and I don't believe the New Testament. I believe what you call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Those are the Holy Scriptures. And the Christian man looked back and said, I was reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. I was reading from the prophet Isaiah. I was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. One writer put it this way about Isaiah chapter 53. He said, Our present passage speaks so eloquently of the work of Christ that even the inclusion of His name could add but little more to the extent of its disclosure of Him. In other words, Isaiah chapter 53 screams Jesus even though we never see his name mentioned. Jesus is the suffering servant of Isaiah chapter 53. So much so that that Jewish man, he couldn't deny that that passage must be talking about Jesus, even though he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. We've been studying Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, through Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, and, uh, and, and we find ourselves coming to the end of this series, and we've been asking this question. When John the Baptist said, as Jesus approached the crowd, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, what did he, what did God ultimately want to go through the minds of those Jewish listeners? When he said, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And I think he wanted all of the prophecies from the Hebrew Scriptures, from our Old Testament, to begin to flow through their minds. But I can't help but think the primary passage must have been Isaiah chapter 52, verse 
13 through Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. And so we've been slowly working our way through this passage. Uh, John the Baptist said, Behold my servant. And this passage begins, Behold, excuse me, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. And this passage begins, Behold my servant. And so we have been trying to behold this servant so that we can understand better who Jesus is. Now, remember Isaiah, the prophet, is writing about 700 years before Jesus showed up here on this earth. And he's prophesying about a coming servant who would suffer immensely and through his suffering would be the promised deliverer. Now, this if you scan your eyes, if you want to back up from 53 to chapter 52, verse 12, we, we've said that this passage is really um, like a, almost like a song. It's like a poem, and it's divided up into five three-verse sections. As we've been taking three verses at a time for about four weeks now, and we're going to look at the last three verses of this passage. If you'll just scan your eyes through, and we'll be reminded in verses 13 through 15, we learned that this is the wisdom-displaying servant. In chapter 53, verses 1 through 3, we saw that this is the strength-revealing man. In chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, we saw that this servant, who is Jesus, is the sin-bearing Savior. In verses 7 through 9, we saw last week that he is the life-forsaking Lamb. But although Jesus forsook, that is, give up, he gave up his own life, although Jesus died, which is where verse 9 leaves, left us last week, we know that Jesus did not stay Dead. And so I want to read the last three verses of chapter 53, and we'll dive right in. Beginning in verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Would you pray with me? Father, Would you open up our hearts and minds to receive the truth of your word today? Help us not to be hearers only, but doers of your word. Help us to be led to believe in Jesus and to worship Jesus and to live for Jesus, this suffering servant. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You want a main idea statement for this passage, uh, for verses 10 through 12, it's this. Jesus... Jesus fits the picture of the resurrected king who triumphantly defeated death and provides everlasting life. He is the death conquering king. Jesus is the death conquering king. We'll say that one more time. Jesus fits this picture prophesied 700 years before of the resurrected king who triumphantly defeated death and provides for us everlasting life. We get to these last three verses In this passage, this last stanza of this servant song or servant poem. And one writer said this, this final stanza is like a reservoir into which flow all the main lines of thought developed throughout the poem. In other words, we're going to tie up everything. We're going to see in this passage everything that we've been looking at. Just like kind of the chorus of a song would summarize what that song is about. So this last stanza does for this entire passage. Now, I'm going to share with you three truths, one from verse 10, one from verse 11, and one from verse 12. But in each of those, under each of those truths, in each of these verses, we want to see three different things. The same thing and just some different information about these three things. We saw, saw all throughout this passage this theme of exaltation. We started there in the very beginning, that this servant will be high and lifted up and exalted. So we're going to see this theme of exaltation. We've seen this theme of suffering all throughout this passage, and we've seen this theme of salvation from sin. And here's how we're going to talk about those three in this particular passage. The exaltation, we're going to talk about his resurrection. The suffering for sin is his death, and the salvation from sin is the blessing that we receive. We're going to talk about these three things in each of these verses. 
resurrection of the servant who is Jesus, the death of the servant who is Jesus, and the blessing that comes to his people as a result. Jesus' resurrection shows that his death actually accomplished the intended outcome. Blessing for the people of God all to the glory of God. You see, we can't celebrate the resurrection without talking about and thinking deeply about and focusing on the death of Jesus, his crucifixion. We cannot celebrate the resurrection without continuing to focus on the cross. And so we're going to talk about the resurrection, we're going to talk about the cross, his death, and we're going to talk about the blessing that comes to us. Truth number one. Jesus' resurrection means his death provides us with eternal forgiveness. Jesus' resurrection means that his death provides us with eternal forgiveness. So where do we see resurrection here in verse number 10? Well, let's look at it. It says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, notice this phrase, he shall see his offspring. Notice this phrase, he shall prolong his days. And notice this phrase, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now remember where we left off in verse 9. This servant is dead. He was buried in verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. This servant is dead at this point in this passage. And yet, it says that he's going to see his offspring. It says that he is going to prolong his days and that the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Here's what that means. The servant must rise from the dead if he is going to see his offspring. The servant must rise from the dead if he is going to prolong his days. And the servant must rise from the dead if the will of the Lord is going to prosper in his hand. Even though we don't see the word resurrection in these last three verses, the resurrection of the servant who is Jesus is all over verses 10, 11, and 12. We see it three times here in verse 10. All of this, of course, in keeping with the other prophecies about the Messiah. One of my favorite prophecies of the Messiah is found in 2 Samuel. And there in 2 Samuel, uh, God is conversing with with David and and he tells David, he reveals to King David that he is going to give David a son, an offspring. And this son, this offspring there in 2 Samuel chapter 7 is going to be a king. But he's not just going to be any king. He's going to be a forever king on a forever throne. His reign will last eternally. And then we see Isaiah, many years later, falling right in line with that same theme of prolonging his days. This servant will live forever, which means he must rise from the dead. Well, what about his death? Where do we see his death here in verse 10? Well, Obviously, we see in the beginning of verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Not the first time we've seen that word. If we back up to verse 5, it says that he was wounded or pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Some translations will use the word bruise. It's literally a bruising unto death. He was crushed. And it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was God's will that Jesus would be a sacrifice for sin. What amazing love that God the Father has for us that he would will his son to be crushed that he would put him to grief that is that he would put on him the consequences of our sin so that his will would prosper in his hand our salvation we also see his death in that phrase when his soul makes an offering for guilt i love this phrase i love this phrase because it it takes us back further into the old testament I just love, I love how the Bible is just one story. It all fits together. So when we see this phrase, his soul or his life, you can translate it like soul or life. His soul or life makes an offering for guilt. It takes us back to Leviticus chapter 5. If you were to turn to Leviticus chapter 5, you would go, oh yeah, this is one of those places in the Bible where I'm kind of reading through the Bible on my yearly reading plan and I get to this and I'm like, Can I just skip ahead a little bit? Can I just flip through this passage? Why? Because we often say, well, those Old Testament laws about sacrifice and the rituals along with them, they don't apply to us today. In one sense, I would say you're right. In one sense, they don't apply to us today because we don't have to continually offer sacrifices because a once and for all sacrifice has been made and his name is Jesus. And he made that sacrifice when he died on the cross. But in another sense, it is is 
applicable for us because it helps us understand our need for a sacrifice. There in Leviticus chapter 5, and I'll flip there uh, for just a moment, in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 14, on through chapter 6, verse 7, we learn about this specific offering called a guilt offering. There were other kind of offerings. There were sin offerings. There were peace offerings. All sorts of offerings. Here we learn about a guilt offering. And we find some amazing language here in this passage about a guilt offering. Someone sins, and here it's an unintentional sin, and this person is to bring a ram to sacrifice. When he brings this ram to be killed, his blood to be poured out for the guilt offering, we find this phrase, and the priest shall make atonement for him, and the ram of the guilt offering, with the ram of the guilt offering, and he shall be forgiven. Three times in that passage, we find that there's to be an offering for guilt, that atonement will be made through this, and the result is forgiveness. So we talked about his resurrection in verse 10. We talked about his death, his, his soul, his life is a guilt offering. What about the blessing? What blessing comes to us? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. That was the purpose of the guilt offering back in Leviticus. It was to provide forgiveness from sin. What does it mean to be forgiven of something? Maybe someone has forgiven you of something. Maybe you've forgiven someone else of something in your life. A biblical definition of forgiveness is to never hold it against you again. To never hold it against you again. This guilt offering, this servant whose life became a guilt offering as he hung on the cross, the blessing that flows to us as a result of that is that God will no longer hold our sin against us. Hallelujah, right? Amen. That He no longer, He forgives us. He no longer holds our sin against us. That's the, that is the blessing that flows into our lives. This will of the Lord that's prospering in the hand of the servant is the justification of sinners through an atoning sacrifice. Speaking of an atoning sacrifice that provides justification, we want to go on to verse 11. Our second truth today is this. Jesus' resurrection means that his death provides us with eternal righteousness. Not only does it provide us with eternal forgiveness, but it provides us with eternal righteousness. Verse 11. Where do we see the resurrection in verse 11? It says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Hold on, hold on, hold on. But I thought in verse 9, he's dead and in the grave. Now verse 11 is telling us that he's going to see and be satisfied. Another way to say that is that he will be satisfied in his seeing. Well, first of all, if he's dead in the grave, how is he seeing? And how is he satisfied with being in the grave? I don't think I would be satisfied with that. This satisfaction is, is, is kind of like stepping back and looking at something you did and said, hey, that was a job well done. I did it. I accomplished it. Maybe you had a project, you've been working on something, and you get to the end, and you step back, and you go, hey, it worked. It worked. Now, when we do things like that, sometimes we're surprised. I know sometimes I work on things, and if it turns out all right at the end, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that it works. And I step back and go, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that was going to turn out that way. Now, God doesn't do that. He's never surprised when what he does turns out right. Because he is perfect. He's always right. It's, it's, that same, it's the same idea of God stepping back from his creation of the world. And what did he say? It is very good. Right? He stepped back and he was satisfied with what he had made. Same thing here. The servant who, in verse 9, was dead in the grave, is now stepping back and is looking at what he did and is satisfied. Well, how does that happen unless he rises from the dead. The servant must rise from the dead if he is going to see and be satisfied. But what is he going to see and be satisfied with? All right, now let's talk about the death. The death that we see in verse 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. That anguish of his soul, second time we've seen this word soul or life, makes us think back throughout the rest of this passage that we've been studying for several weeks to all of the suffering that this servant endured, the anguish of his soul, all the suffering previously mentioned. And then we can jump down to the end of verse 11, says he shall bear their iniquities. Now we've noticed through, the, through this Isaiah chapter 53 passage that to bear our iniquities, to bear our sins, means that he, the servant, 
gets put to death. Gets put to death. Okay, so he's going to step back and he's going to look at the work that he did. What work is it talking about? His work on the cross. He's going to step back and look at what he did on the cross and he's going to see and be satisfied. Well, why? What is he trying to accomplish? What was his goal? What was his objective in going to the cross and hanging there? This is where we get to the blessing part of verse 11. What blessing flows to us because of Jesus' death, which is validated by his resurrection? The blessing of being counted righteous. The blessing of being counted righteous. You could say to be counted righteous, or you could use the word to be justified. And mean the same thing. And to be justified is to be counted righteous. If you are counted righteous, then you have been justified. Let me ask a question. What does it mean to be made righteous? And why do we need to be made righteous? We'll start with the first question. What does it mean to be made righteous? It, it means to be treated by God as though we were innocent, even though we are guilty. To be treated by God as though we are innocent, even though we are guilty. Guilty of what? Of sin. Of rebellion against God. And we're all guilty of that. You're saying there's a way for me to be treated as, by God as if I'm innocent? Yes, there is. We can be counted righteous. Because God only accepts perfection. That's all God can accept. He's a perfect God. He can only accept perfection. Being made righteous means being made acceptable to God. That's what it means. When we're counted righteous, it means that all of a sudden we are acceptable to God. And that is our greatest need in life. Why? Second question, why do we need to be made righteous? Because we're not. We need to be made righteous. We need to be accounted righteous. Because we're not. No one is righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. And we know that. We know that in our heart of hearts. And in our heart of hearts, we know that to stand before God and for Him to look at us and see our sin would mean that we would be punished and rejected from God. But if we could stand before God and God see righteousness then we would not be rejected, but we would, we would be welcomed. We would be accepted. We know that. I was talking with a guy just this week. We ran into each other. I won't go into all the details, but long story short, I found myself sitting next to a guy, and we struck up a conversation, and, and um, he's Hindu, and, and we started talking about what we believe, and, 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 and he believes just like most other religions in the world. He believes that, one, that you can believe whatever you want to believe and we all end up in heaven, which is wrong. And we talked about that. I shared with him what Jesus says, that he's the only way. And so if Jesus is the only way, that means all the other ways aren't a way. They're not ways. But he, he, he kept making this comment over and over. And, and it, just, it speaks to this truth that we know in our heart of hearts that Something has to happen in order for us to be accepted by God. When we stand before God, God better see some good. He kept saying over and over that he said, I just do good, I do good, I do good, I do good. And I do good for people and I do good and I'm living my life to try to be a good person. I try to be a good person. I try to be a good person. And so I know one day when I stand before God, these are his words, when I stand before God one day that, that he will... Say, welcome, because I've done good things. And I said, I said, but God has said you're not good. <laughs> and God has said that I'm not good. But notice he knew that God needed to see good in his life when he stood before God one day if he was going to be accepted. The problem is that he thought he could be good by himself. He thought he could do good things. And I shared with him the good news of Jesus Christ. That even though we can't be good, Jesus was good for us. We can't be righteous in and of ourselves, but Jesus was righteous for us. Notice this great exchange that takes place. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. The righteous one takes our sin upon himself, and in exchange for that, he gives us his righteousness. 
He clothes us with His righteousness. And so that when we stand before God, clothed with the righteousness of Jesus, God will say, welcome. I accept you into my presence. Not because you are good, but because my Son is good. And He paid the price for your sin. I wonder today, your sin has been atoned for by the blood of Christ. I wonder today if you have been made righteous. I wonder today if you are wearing the clothes of righteousness purchased for you by Jesus on the cross. One writer said of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11, it's one of the fullest statements of atonement theology ever penned. I'll make that statement a little bit simpler for us. I'll say it's one of the fullest statements of the gospel ever penned. That the righteous one took our sin and in exchange gives us his righteousness. If you've never been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus, if today you are living under the guilt of your sin, you know that you're not good and you know that you can't be good enough to measure up to God's standard of perfection, today you can be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Scripture says that if we will place our faith in Jesus, that means to trust that what Jesus did on the cross was enough to save us from our sin. It's kind of like to do the same thing Jesus does, to step back and say, that work was good enough. To step back and say, I'm satisfied with my work. It is finished. There's no more price for sin to be paid. I have accomplished salvation for my people. And if we will look at the cross and believe the same thing, that Jesus accomplished our salvation there on the cross, trusting in His finished work, Scripture says that we will be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. What's He going to see and be satisfied with? One person said it this way, the fruits and rewards of his messianic suffering. I'll say it this way, his atoning sacrifice. He will be satisfied with what he did on the cross to save his people. His suffering, his death was not in vain. He accomplished the mission of seeking and saving the lost. The resurrection of Jesus doesn't mean just that the death of Jesus provides for us eternal forgiveness. And here in verse 11, eternal righteousness. But finally, it means that we are provided with eternal intercession. Eternal intercession. Notice our final verse, verse 12. This is getting to the climax here. We are finally here. We've been getting here. We've been getting here. We've been getting here. This servant who was rejected by people, he didn't look like a king. He's hanging bloody on a cross, killed like a criminal would be killed. And this is supposed to be the servant who's going to deliver us? How is that possible? I thought this was going to be a king who was going to ride in and he was going to win the victory, but now he's hanging on a cross. Notice how verse 12 begins. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Notice that. I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Here is again the resurrection of the servant. We have victory language here. When there's a portion to be divided up, to be be passed out, to be acquired. The spoil. When do you have spoil? It's when when the, I don't mean what's in your refrigerator if you leave your food in there too long. I mean the spoil of of, of war, of victory. Where you conquer the enemy and you you plunder and that's, that's the spoil. You reap the rewards of your victory. And that's the language that's used here. Therefore, I'll divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Wait a second. I thought he's hanging on a cross. I thought we killed Jesus. How is he now the victor? Well, because he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay dead. 
He rises up from the grave. And so the servant must rise from the dead if he's going to receive a portion. He must rise from the dead if he's going to divide the spoil. It makes us go straight to Philippians chapter 2. That therefore, where after Paul talks about Jesus humbling himself and becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The father is the victory. Therefore, because his soul made an offering for guilt. Therefore, because of the anguish of his soul. Therefore, because of his death, God was pleased with what his son had done and raises him to new life and gives him the victory. Notice, though, it's interesting. We would think, at least I would think, that this passage that says this servant is the deliverer, and we've been talking about his suffering so much, I would think it would end right there with he's the victor, he's the victor. But it doesn't. It goes back to his death. Some, some biblical scholars have said it's an anticlimactic ending to Isaiah. We want it to end with, he reigns. But Isaiah the prophet, inspired by God, goes back to the cross. In concluding, why? Because it wasn't his resurrection that purchased our salvation. It was his death that purchased our salvation. His resurrection validates what his death accomplished. And so we end with his death because he poured out his soul to death. Third time we've seen that word soul. Notice verse 10, that his soul, his life, makes an offering for guilt. Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, of his life. And now in verse 12, he poured out his soul or his life to death. And we know that he was numbered with the transgressors as he hung there between two thieves. What blessing do we have? Resurrection in verse 12, death in verse 12. What is the blessing? It is this, that we have an intercessor. What's an intercessor? It's a go-between. It's a go-between. There's a disagreement with party A and party B. You've got to get somebody to go between them, to intercede on one's behalf, especially when one has wronged the other. And we have wronged God and we need someone to go between us and God. That was the role of the priest there in the Old Testament. But Jesus fulfills that office once and for all. He is the great high priest and Jesus goes before the Father and he pleads his own death on our behalf. He goes to the Father and He says, Yes, Father, I know that He sinned. Yes, Father, I know that she sinned. But I paid the price for His sin. I paid the price for her sin. And you can accept Him, Father. You can accept her, Father, because I have now clothed Him. I have clothed her in my own righteousness. Notice. Yet He bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Romans chapter 8, verse 34, we find these words. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, for Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, talking about the earthly temple, but he has entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And one more place, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, and we all have, we have an advocate. That is an intercessor with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And in all three of those places where Jesus is mentioned as our intercessor, it is all in the context of his death on the cross for you and for me. Eternal forgiveness. Amazing. What a gift. Eternal righteousness. Amazing. What a gift. Eternal intercession. Amazing. What a gift. As we sang about a few minutes ago, hallelujah, what 
a Savior. When Jesus intercedes, notice this. When Jesus intercedes, he pleads his death and his righteousness on our behalf, which results in us being forgiven and us being counted righteous. Jesus tells the Father, I paid the price for his sin. I clothed her in my righteousness. The Father then welcomes us instead of rejecting us, which means if we're welcomed instead of rejected, that means we receive life instead of death. And because Jesus rose from the dead, he is the victor over the greatest enemy, which scripture tells us is death. And because he's the victor over death, he's going to live forever. And so if Jesus rose from the dead, which he did, and if he's going to live forever, which he will, that means that he is an eternally righteous, sin-bearing, guilt-offering who eternally intercedes for us. And because he intercedes for us eternally, forever and ever and ever, we have as a result eternal life. Eternal life. Everlasting life. Jesus' resurrection means that his death provides us with eternal life. Amen? That's the gospel right here in Isaiah chapter 53. When John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. God wanted the people then, and He wants us today to realize that they were, that we are beholding the suffering servant of Isaiah. Jesus. Jesus fits the picture in the first stanza of the exalted servant who wisely rose to the highest throne through great suffering. In the second stanza of this passage, Jesus fits the picture of the rejected man who strangely revealed the saving strength of God. In the third stanza, Jesus fits the picture of the suffering Savior who graciously bore the weight of sin for undeserving sinners. In the fourth stanza, I think I said fourth and I meant to say third. In the fourth stanza now, Jesus fits the picture of the perfect lamb who willingly sacrificed his life for those who deserve death. And now in this final stanza, Jesus, Jesus, and no one else fits the picture of the resurrected king who triumphantly defeated death and provides us with everlasting life. Listen to me. Jesus and Jesus alone is the death conquering king, not just for himself, but for all who would trust in Him. For all who trust in His death and resurrection. See, that's the good news. If you trust in Jesus, if I trust in Jesus, then we get to share in the victory spoil. We get to share in the riches of victory. Not just for a little while, but for all of eternity. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ? He alone is our salvation. Have you believed in Him? If so, give Him your life. Every moment of every day, worship Him. Tell others about Him. If you haven't, today, repent of your sins. Turn to Jesus Christ and receive the blessing of salvation from the One who died and rose again for you and for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You for what Jesus did on the cross. We worship You, Father. In this moment, we want to respond. Lord, if there is sin in our hearts, if we've never trusted in Christ, Father, for that person, I pray that right now, he or she would repent and trust in Jesus for salvation. Father, for those of us who have, Lord, I pray that we would just be thankful. That we would declare the glory and the Love and mercy and grace that you have bestowed upon us through Jesus. Father, we respond in this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're